Now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who I'm very excited about. You can all know that I'm like a space nut. So our next speaker is Peter Beck from Rocket Lab. So he's CEO and technical di director of um, Rocket Lab, which is New Zealand's rocket technology company, which he founded back in 2006. So in 2009, Peter led Rocket Lab to accomplish its first major goal of building and launching um, its first rocket, a tier one, to reach space. If you haven't seen the video of this on YouTube, please go watch it because it's freaking awesome. Like literally the excitement. I was there and you do the countdown and I was there and it was just so excited. And you realize that we've just made this huge, amazing rocket go to space from, from something Peter just, you know, what seemed to be made in his backyard. Now, Rocket Lab has advanced a lot since then, obviously. And this year, um, Rocket Lab has announced Electron, the 18 meter, 10 ton carbon composite launch vehicle which will allow the launch of satellite constellations at a fraction of the cost. Before forming Rocket Lab, Peter's already prestigious career included working with IRL on my favorite levitating material, high temperature superconductors. And Peter has been awarded the Royal Society Cooper Medal for the best single account of research in physics and engineering, as well as the meritorious medal from the Royal Aeronautical Society of Services of an exceptional nature leading to major advances in New Zealand aviation. So Peter was one of these kids who grew up in a techie family, surrounded by engineers and workshops. He was the kid, apparently, who just had lots of tools and bash stuff. And apparently nothing's changed since then. Apart from he went to get um, an advanced trade in precision engineering, giving him the practical foundation needed to develop Rocket Lab's unique propulsion technology. Peter is known throughout New Zealand as Rocket Man. And when asked what he would tell his younger startup self, he said, don't mess around with a small fry. Just go straight for the big fish. And with that, I'd like to introduce Peter Beck. Thanks very much, Michelle. I think you've pretty much taken over about half my talk there. So, um, so uh, just kind of briefly, New Zealand's not known for its um, space prowess. And Really how I started Rocket Lab is I, I was uh, in America and I was visiting all the companies that I'd been corresponding with for years and years. And it sort of realized that actually I don't want to be a tiny gear in a giant machine of Lockheed Martin or, or one of those big um, space contractors. And really, even if I made a big time in, in those contractors, um, they're really not gonna do what I want to do and, and make a, a, real, a real difference. Um, so, Pretty much, uh, Michelle's said everything that needs to be said there. Um, but apart from the fact that uh, um, you know we've done a done a lot with uh, organisations like DARPA and uh, ultimately Lockheed Martin and uh, various other um, space companies in the US, uh, last year um, we uh, we knuckled down and decided we were going to do um, uh, the electron launch vehicle, and so we went over to Silicon Valley and uh, and raised our, our first A round. And for me, it was really important to get the, the right kind of capital. Um, we probably could have raised the A round in New Zealand, but um, what we're looking to do is basically hit control alt delete on the space industry. And um, if you're gonna do that, you, you, know, you have the potential to piss a lot of people off. So uh, we really wanted to make sure we had the right sort of capital behind us and the right sort of horsepower to go and actually execute on, on doing what we wanted to do. So just really quickly, just to sort of give you some context to why the electron launch vehicle is important and what we're trying to do is, is important is um, some fun facts. Last year, America went to space 19 times. The average cost of the mission was 132 million. So if you're a startup with a small satellite and looking to do something uh, pretty significant in space or anything in space for that matter, uh, it's a massive barrier to the, to, to the market. And the way I kind of liken it is, if you imagine a, a freight train going across America 12 times a year at an enormously expensive cost, um, then it, you know, the, the whole country grinds to a halt and then along comes FedEx and uh, things start to move along. So we're kind of FedEx to space in, in a lot of respects. And that comes down to the two main things that actually we need to change with space to, to really open that market up and that is cost but not necessarily cost per kilogram, but how much capital do I need to go and raise to get my asset into, into orbit to generate revenue and launch frequency, actually a service that goes there more than a dozen times a year. So we created the um, Electron launch vehicle and uh, instead of 132 million, it's 4.9 million, and we lift a uh, 100 kilogram um, satellite to a 500 kilometer sun synchronous orbit, which is, uh, if, you're, if you're a space geek, it's a, like a Skybox class satellite. 
But the real difference, I guess the real, the real difference here is we started off with a clean sheet of paper and we said, okay, we want to open space up. Um, how are we going to do that? And um, the first thing we did is we looked at our launch sites and we pulled out 20 years of weather and we said, okie dokie, um, these are the weather conditions that, that we're going to have to deal with because we want to launch at least once a week instead of once a month or a few times a year, at least once a week. So we pulled out that 20 years of weather and uh, that's what drove the design of the vehicle. That's what sized the vehicle, that's what sized the structural margins, is being able to launch at least once a week in, in any weather condition just about. And the other thing we, we did is, is designed it for manufacture. So every decision we take there is, is, design, is about how we, can we mass produce this, how can we reduce costs and increase manufacturability, which in the space industry is generally nine or 10 down the priority list. But I guess the, 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 biggest, the biggest thing for us is actually launching this out in New Zealand. And it might, might sound kind of strange, you know, why, why do this in New Zealand in the first place? Surely America or Europe is a place to go to actually go and change the space industry. But it, it's kind of an interesting little thing. Um, so we went over to America and spoke to all the launch ranges over there and said, OK, we want to launch once a week. And uh, as much as they'd like to do that, they all kind of laughed at us. Um, because there's just so much stuff there. There's so much aircraft, so many aircraft movements, so much shipping movement, so many people that even though they wanted to, there was just no way of launching more than you know, once a month, really. I mean, to launch multiple times in a week was just an absurd proposition. So um, along comes little, little New Zealand here. We're a small island nation in the middle of nowhere. And uh, basically, I got nothing to hit until Chile. So um, <laughs> I'm good to go. And uh, there's no aircraft movements, really, um, and there's no marine shipping, uh, and we can go sun synchronous right out to a 46 degree space station orbit out of the one side. So it's really, really the ideal place to, to do this. And you know, we all speak English and we're not corrupt and we get on with the US, it's, it's, it's all perfect. So that, that's kind of the, the, the background there, but I'll just go through some, some real quick uh, lessons that, that I've learned along, along my journey. So the first one is get on a plane. Um, and that sort of goes, goes back to the previous comment about talking to your customers intimately. And, you know, I think Kiwi's sometimes a little bit afraid to just get on a plane and, and get over there, go, get over to America, wherever your market is, immerse yourself in it and, um, and just, just go and talk to your customers and go and really understand your, your industry. Um, don't mess around with small fry. I think that's probably the, the one thing that I've learned from, from, you know, seven years of Rocket Lab is, uh, don't bother with the little companies. Um, if you're trying to do strategic partnerships, just go straight for the big stuff. And, and that's the, the same for our capital raise as well. Let's not mess around with um, small tiers. Let's go to the tier one, the big guys, and the deep pockets, and, and just go. Only talk to the deciders. Um, so if you're going over to the valley, or, or, or anywhere for that matter, or any part of your business, only talk to the deciders. And the way I kind of do this, and it works particularly well in America, is um, if I'm going to go and talk to someone, say, within Lockheed Martin, I'll just go straight to the chief scientist. And sometimes you've got to bluff your way in there, but the ironic thing is there's, there's much more of a, a sort of a protocol or a diplomatic protocol in America, I've found. You know, it, you don't, it's not kind of that right to just go and approach the chief scientist. Usually you would approach you know, his juniors and work your way up. But you can use that to your advantage because if you approach that chief scientist, he kind of thinks that you've already gone through the process of going up through all your juniors, but, but you haven't. But you go straight to him, he assumes that you have, you have good discussions with him, you've got to have something really good to sell. You can't just you know, ask him what the weather's doing, it's got to be, you've got to have something really, really good. And if you've got something really, really good, then it, it's, it just takes care of itself from there onwards. Because now the chief scientist likes what you're doing, and everyone below him assumes that um, you know, the chief scientist wants this, so it must happen. So it perpetuates, you know, sort of a top-down approach, and that, that works. That works really well, especially I think for Kiwis. Um, don't disclose who you're talking to, um, with uh, with with investors, especially. Um, make sure you've got uh, as best you can everybody um, segregated, and you know, just don't don't disclose who you're talking to. If you want, to, your job is to to leverage your valuation. So you don't want people talking and coercing and trying to trying to do deals alongside you. Have hardware. Um, if you're a software company, um, still have hardware, I believe. You need something physical that somebody can touch. And it can't just be rotten hardware. It has to be just beautiful work of art hardware. 
that's what that's what you have to have with you and um, that that makes you know I've found that makes a huge difference and and I travel to America with a rocket engine um, and a stack of paperwork this high but nevertheless to America with a rocket engine and there's there's nothing that gets someone more excited than just putting a rocket engine on the table and having a discussion it works really well um, use deadlines and this is this is great for Kiwis, um, especially once again if you if you if you're raising capital or doing anything in America or anywhere else in the world, for example, have deadlines and and use them because you know things can people get excited, but excited is not a deal. Um, you've got to you've got to progress things and, and use deadlines to, to to you know to make things happen. And it's really easy when you're a Kiwi up in the US. Um, you're up there and look, I'm only here for a week. Um, you don't sort of disclose that you could easily stay another week, but you're, you're only here for the week um, and uh, people will move schedules to talk to you. Um, so you, you really use that one um, to your advantage. <coughs> and a pitch, a pitch when, when you're pitching to try and raise capital, um, you know, it really, it really needs to tell a story. It's really, it's really got to be you know, very passionate, and and I kind of liken it to, to theatre almost. I mean, you're trying to tell your your story. You're trying to get across your your you know your idea or, or what's what's going to change the world and why it's important to you and everybody everybody else. If you put up a, a, a you know a pitch deck with a whole lot of details and graphs and and bog into details and numbers, which may be exciting to you as an engineer or or, or whatever you're doing, um, really uh, you know. The, the venture capital guys are just just not interested. And they want to, they want to hear the story about about everything. So really really focus on that. <coughs> the other one I want to talk about is why base your business in New Zealand. Um, and uh, you know there's a lot of um, New Zealand startups and you know the community sort of starting to grow and all the rest of it. But I take a kind of a different approach to this, um, and it might not be particularly popular, but really only base your business in New Zealand if there's a good geographical advantage. If you're a software company that's that's going to do something that you know bolts right up into Apple, then you need to be in the valley. Um, just don't bother trying to do it in New Zealand. Just get on a plane and go to where you need to go to get the job done. This is about you know your idea, you you building your business, you you doing something for humanity. It's not it's not about I want to live in Auckland. It's 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 much bigger than that. So, you know, only stay in New Zealand if there's a great geographic advantage. If you make it big, you're coming home with loads of cash. So it's all good. The other thing I want to talk about is a billion dollar company um, in, in, in New Zealand and for me when I started Rocket Lab um, I wasn't interested in building a hundred million dollar company. I wasn't interested in, in you know, building a, a, a medium or large, you know, small to medium company. I'm, 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 in, I'm in this to build a big billion dollar company. I'm in it to change the space industry, that's the prime driver, but I'm also in it to build, if we're going to do it, you know, let, let's do it properly and let's build a billion dollar company. And, the thing that I've found is that Kiwis generally don't sit there and aim to build a billion dollar company. They, they, they want to build an idea and, and you know, build a little company and end up with a batch and a boat and a BMW, you know, the three Bs. But they don't really think there, well, how can I take this global, how can I make this a billion dollar company or multi-billion dollar company, how can this be as big as Apple? Um, so I think that's something that Kiwis really need to work on because in my experience, the ideas are billion dollar ideas. Um, some of the people I've, I've bumped into in America, you know, a lot of them in, in high levels are often Kiwis and, and they're doing great things, but New Zealand needs to build billion dollar companies if we, we want to want to really grow as a country. And go after the really big problems. I mean, we're trying to change the space industry, that's, that's a decent enough problem, but there's other, other problems there um, that, that are really big that New Zealand can, can go after and solve, so that, that's kind of my advice on that one. And then if you've got a big idea and you're looking to build a billion dollar capital, a uh, billion, billion dollar company, then go after the big capital. Um, don't mess around with the, the little, the little you know, mum and dad investors. Just get on a plane, get over the valley or wherever you've got to go and, and go big. And that's kind of the last point is, is, you know, go big or go home. I mean, if you're going to slog your, you know, slog your life away for the next five or ten years building a startup, it may as well be a billion dollar one. You may as well aim to have a billion dollar one. And a, and, a, and a roadmap to get to a billion dollar one than a hundred million dollar one. So the last thing I want to try is, is just this little experiment. And I don't generally do a lot of these kind of talks, but I like to do um, try and find time to do it to this, these kind of community, communities because I think it's really important. 
Um, but generally, um, what I try and do is get people to put their hands up, but that never works because the Kiwis are too shy. So I want everybody to start by putting their hands up this time. We're going to try something different. Right, very good. So I want everyone to put their hands down who is um, an investor or currently runs a, a company. Um, so anybody who currently runs a company who is an investor, okay, cool. I want people to put their hands down if, um, if they're not contemplating creating a startup. So in theory here, we should only have people's hands up who are looking at creating a startup. Very good, right. So I want you to put your hands down if um, you're on your deathbed and you're sitting there and you're thinking, rightio, um, I've had a good life, I've got a lovely wife, I've had good children, um, I've got a nice car, I've built a nice company, um, and uh, everything's been great. Um, so put, put your hands down if you would be happy to die like that. <laughs> wow. So Scott and Sam, the from Founders Fund and, and various, um, these are the people that you should be investing in. Because I guarantee if you ask these people, um, you know, why is your hand still up? The, the answer is probably, well, that's actually not good enough for me. I want to actually make a difference in the world. I want to do something significant with my life. And, you know, you get one chance on planet Earth. You get one right around. So, you know, you really need to make it count. Um, so go and take note who's got their hands up, guys, and go and talk to those guys. So that's me, thanks very much.